we know echo thank goodness welcome to this webinar on anchor institutions really pleased to see so many people in the room and very excited that we're going to be running this webinar today um, it's been a long time in the making um, and we have an exciting group of panelists um, who are here with us uh, before I start, I would also like to acknowledge um, the members of our reference team who are in the room. I see that it's Diane Hornby, um, Rodney, Professor Rodney Apoff, um, and then our co-chair who took some time um, off, uh, Professor Ntabi Singh Ogude. Really welcome. You should be sitting in the seat and not me. And I really would like you to join in all of you into these conversations as they unfold today. So a little bit about the US South African Higher Education Network. Inyatelo was um, brought in as a partner on the USSA Higher Education Network. And we, we are here with Pretoria University and what, was, what started off at the University of Rutgers in Newark um, has moved now to um, moved with um, Professor Kyle Farmbury to, um, to his new, uni new institution. Um, and so we are really pleased that we're still continuing this work. The work that Inyatelo has been tasked to do is to work on third stream income, which is linked to our advancement function. We were asked to work on this, um, a, developing a concept paper on anchor institutions. And we're also working with Serena, who has been doing incredibly incredible work with the HDIs in the sector. Um, today we have, and I'm not going to be sitting here long, it's, um, I really feel very, very privileged to have Professor Nico Kruti here. Um, for many of you may remember him as one of the leadi leading um, educationists um, in higher education, he still is. He was the CEO of the National Commission on Higher Education. He was the CEO of the Center for Higher Education Transformation, and he's currently Professor at Crest, where he is working on the Herani um, program um, for African universities. Nico has a wealth of knowledge. He is an interesting um, academic, has always had um, uh, a, you know, he has always been a visionary. And so while many of us have only started this work recently, um, he together with Leslie Bank and Samuel wrote a book um, a few years ago. And so I thought they would make a wonderful combination in this conversation. We also have um, with us today the, the author of the paper who is Samuel Fongwa, Dr. Samuel Fongwa, who is a senior research specialist in the Inclusive Economic Development Division at the Human Science Research Council, which is based in Pretoria. He joined the HSRC as a postdoc um, in 2016. His research expertise is cross-disciplinary and it includes areas of higher education studies and development studies. He has a transdisciplinary theme focus and has worked extensively in the area of, of anchor institutions and community engagement. Um, Professor Leslie Bank um, is currently the strategic lead on the livelihoods and on livelihoods and education in the inclusive economic development Div division at the Human Science Research Council. He joined the HSRC as deputy executive director of the Economic Development and Performance Un Unit in 2016. He also holds adjunct positions at Walter Sisula University and the University of Forte. Both are historically black institutions. Professor Bank was previously the founding director of the Forte Institute of Social and Economic Research, and he has worked at several other South African universities, including UCT, but St. Joe's. Um, there's so much to say about all three three people who are joining us today, but I'm not going to spend time talking about them, but rather to give you all the space to engage. Um, and once again, thanks for joining in Atello on this lovely afternoon um, for a, a serious conversation on, on the strategic role that universities can play in the development of the communities that they find themselves in. Um, the COVID pandemic has really um, 
pointed to the need for much more responsive institutions, particularly in a country like ours, where there's such great inequality. And so I'm going to hand over to Nico. Professor Kluti, it's over to you. And thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that I know, uh, and I see Ms. Ogude was also there. Uh, I still remember our trip to the US. I was contacted by Nasima about this uh, anchor. Uh, so I wrote a, a comment back and said the last time I heard about anchor institutions was around about 2010 or 2012. And what, what are you now busy with this with? Then she said, no, but you published a book in 2018 with the title Anchor Institutions. So I said, no, but it was the wrong title. Uh, that wasn't about anchor institutions. But then I remember Leslie Bank likes this title and he likes to talk about uh, anchor institutions. I think it's a, it's, it's a concept that has sort of come, come and gone and currently probably somewhat on the decline in some ways. And uh, uh, in other ways, but it's always important. I have moved more towards the issue of, um, of higher education and development. And the, my 2012 book on higher education and development uh, has been translated by the Chinese into Mandarin, uh, the only book on African higher education that they've translated. And the uh, simple reason was not that it was such a fantastic book, but it was one of the only books uh, in Africa that tried to link higher education to development. And now at Stellenbosch, we're starting with another book on the, also the issue of higher education and development for two reasons. The one is uh, we uh, took a decision a week ago. Uh, the term transformation will not be used in the book uh, uh, because transformation is a term that has taken us nowhere. It's not a term that you can uh, quantify. Nobody agrees what transformation is. And it's actually a distractor and it usually has huge economic uh, political implications and it gets people off the track, et cetera. So, so our new book is going to be called Higher Education and Knowledge Production, Equity and Development. The issue, the two central issues is, uh, the central issue is development. And I mean, we all know that the development uh, plan in South Africa has collapsed. I mean, our, uh, you can transform, you can have a, a, a institutions who what very score very high on equity, uh, but uh, they're making no contribution to development. That becomes just a form of elite formation. So uh, the issue then comes back to what, what does development mean and how difficult it is to show empirically uh, that uh, higher education is contributing to development. The famous old Philip Ockbach, I sent him an email and said, Philip, just, just send me a bit of the evidence that you have for this, because he's written a number of things on, on the importance of higher education and development. And he sent me a cryptic email back and said, uh, I've got no evidence, but we just all know that it does. Uh, there's no development without higher education. So <laughs> that was, a, that was a, to me, a very interesting uh, the dilemma that we're in. Now, anchor institutions for me are, my problem that I have with anchor institutions is that they, it's a very good idea and it's how a lot of universities link to the local, but it, it tends to forget the bigger development project. So the issue is how does one, how does one keep a kind of a connection between the university being involved in local development in, uh, in the city, in, in the place where they are. And the other important role of universities, how do you uh, connect to the development project of the region and not to mention of the country? And we've actually decided that for our book, we're going to have to, uh, there are certain statistical in indicators that, that links uh, number of graduates, uh, knowledge output, and things like that to certain development indicators. But they're very in indirect. And, uh, and then there's, of course, the huge uh, development contribution of the university by uh, who produce the professionals. Uh, uh, 
but it's also not easy to measure how exactly they, they contribute to development. And then we come to the, uh, but we, we also thought, uh, and after looking around a bit, that actually to make the case for higher education and development, that the, the, region, the local region, the local, the city, is a, is a very important uh, uh, indicator. And one, can, one of the things that we started doing is looking at the, what we call the, the Cape Town Stellenbosch corridor. Uh, we discovered that there's 40,000 innovation jobs that has been created in this corridor. And there's something like 2,000 uh, small companies that has developed uh, uh, in this triangle, actually, between Cape Town, Stellenbosch, and Somerset West. So I, I don't think these institutions, there's a tension for the institution because the institution wants to contribute locally, but the institution also wants to be global. The, the, the prestige, the academic prestige is part of the, to be part of the international community. So I think this is a, a very, I'm very positive about this development and, I'm, and for us to think through the, the issues of anchor development and also to develop some better indicators that we can actually say we can actually demonstrate uh, the contribution that the university makes in, in local development uh, uh, and that one can use that then in terms of linking and promoting the university uh, to, to the community where, where it's based. So I think I'm not going to say much more about that right now. I think uh, Nasima, shall we? To add okay. to Samuel. To, for Sam to start for us. So over to you, Samuel. Thank you. Thanks, Nasima. Uh, thank you, Nico. I'll just, I hope I can share my screen. Right. Okay. Can you see my screen? Nico, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, I think we'll have a better conversation after the presentation as to how much uh, Angkor institutions can can make the contribution that they should make uh, both locally while not losing the national and the international perspective. Uh, Nazima, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for having me as part of uh, this, this, this project. Uh, you did introduce me. I have worked uh, with Angkor Institution for a while, but as you will know, uh, it is, you are the first person to have brought me to this literature after having worked on community engagement for, for quite a while. So my, my interest has been to see to what extent and how the, the, the literature on universities community engagement uh, fits or speaks to the concept of anchor institutions. And so that was really my interest uh, coming on, onto the project. Uh, for, for this afternoon, I'll be speaking for about 20 minutes or so. And uh, I think the title is it's 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 a bit uh, much more than I can do in these twenty minutes. Of course, I I cannot be able to 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 provide the whole picture of the implications of this 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 framework on South African universities. But my my hope is that I can be able to provide some kind of a gist as to how uh, to provide. An overview of the of, of notion of anchor institutions and to show to some extent how South African universities are, are responding both actively or consciously as well as unconsciously or passively to the notion of being anchor institutions. And so I will provide a few examples from South African uh, universities which have already been have started using this, this terminology either in strategic plans or in the way they relate with their communities. And of course, that's after mapping out what are anchor institutions from the definition, what are the key indicators and key principles to be considered as an anchor institution. 
Uh, of course, the idea of an empirical study is that I will not be able to talk to it now, but the idea is that we need to be able to develop more empirical studies for us to be to, to actually say to what extent the framework or, or, or speaks within the South African context. So a historical account of South African, of, of anchor institutions, as we will know, uh, anchor institutions, it comes really from a, it's a US-based concept, which really emerged uh, following the rundown of many cities where in, uh, universities found themselves uh, in the neighborhood of 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 poverty of communities with, uh, plagued by poverty and poor infrastructural development, and so universities took upon themselves to be able to work with communities to develop uh, to to develop their communities uh, where the local government or the or the city government was failing to be able to address some of these needs, and so a number of different types of of, of anchor institutions can be perceived. As universities can 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 uh, 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 universities, firms or large companies, industrial units can be perceived as anchor institutions. But as we will see down the line, based on how they relate with their communities, uh, I will highlight some of the tensions and contradictions between anchor institutions and and community engagement literature. And, 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 and speak to how anchor institutions have responded to the issue of place-based development. So in terms of the relationship between universities and their communities or society, as Nico was, 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 was talking a, a while ago, I think higher education institutions and universities most often bring a unique blend uh, of assets to their communities. Uh, these include the intellectual capital, the human capital, the, the fiscal resource in terms of structure and infrastructural development, but as well as the economic value uh, of, of, of expenses, uh, salaries, and social capital which universities bring to their communities. Hence, the social mission of institutions of higher learning uh, should be able to prioritize their contribution to the different aspects of, the, of, of, of society. Uh, that's including knowledge production, uh, skills development, but also the word that Nico does not want to hear, transformation, which is development in, 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 in different forms, be it economic development, social development, or citizenship development. But universities have always adopted this, this mandate or this mission uh, towards their communities. This mission can be applied both locally uh, through understanding uh, the different concerns of the local co context, but as well as contributing to the global knowledge or research uh, project uh, through al aligning their research to some of the global challenges that we have. And so the tension has always e existed between the local imperative as well as the global uh, or national mandate of, the, of, of, of universities. The OECD in one of its very, very well-known publications to locally, globally competitive and locally engaged, tries to engage with this, this tension where universities are expected to use the knowledge. And this knowledge needs to be globally com competitive to be able to speak to local concerns and local, uh, for it to have local implications or local re uh, relevance. And so increasingly from the anchor institution literature, in universities, especially in the US, are now realizing that the fate of their communities are intrinsically tied to theirs. And a very interesting example in the South African context is the case of Alice and the University of Fort Hare. Increasingly, in the last couple of years, we kind of see more emphasis from Fort Hare literature or policy documents to the, Queen, the, the East London campus, and not much on the Alice campus because of the nature of how the Alice uh, Alice as a community has failed to make the kind of development that the university would have wanted for it. And so considering this, one would expect that Fort Hare in Alice will begin to adopt an anchoring mandate to be able to see how can this university uh, using its a, a place responsive approach begin to contribute to the transformation or the development of its communities. And that, and, and that really becomes the main argument around the, the, the anchor literature. 
how can you more universities realize that their communities, uh, their faith and the faith of their communities are somewhat in intrinsically tied, tied together. And hence, in defining uh, anchor institutions, uh, many definitions have been provided, but I will propose these two which have informed the, the paper. The first is the issue of, as I've just mentioned, the universities uh, realizing that they are rooted in their local communities, and this must be seen by their mission and vision statements. Uh, they should be able to develop relationships with their customers, with their employees, with the residents and vendors. Uh, it goes on to say that anchor institutions have an ability to engage in long-term planning, of course, because universities are there for the long haul, in a manner that aligns the institutional interest and these interests include locally, nationally, and globally to those of the local communities. They have both ability and motivation to play a key role in improving the long-term well-being of the com communities. And, and that leads to developing an anchor strategy, which is the intentional deployment of the institution's geographically bound asset and economic power to re revitalizing neighborhoods where individuals face historical barriers. And some, somehow this is a, a, main, a major difference between the anchor literature and the community engagement literature, where there is not always a, a direct commitment to the community's well-being, uh, but community engagement is more conceived as an academic uh, enterprise. And so two framings for anchor institutions have been provided, and I'm not going to really focus on all of these, but the key things are the last bullet points in terms of how the anchor institutions are framed in, them, in their role in the community. And these are across four key functions. Uh, the first from the action agenda framework is that anchor institutions are supposed to, to serve the core institutional role. And that speaks to their function as knowledge producers in teaching and learning and engaging with their communities from a really community engagement perspective, which we, we might be more versed with. But it goes further to talk about the economic role, its role in physical development and public service. And this is also echoed in the democratic collaborative framework, which talks about the economic development role, the community building role, the education role, as well as the, and this includes research, as well as the, econ, the environmental health and, and safety role. And, and I've tried to put this together in this framework to be able to say, Developing an anchor framework will request that universities embrace or adopt these four roles uh, within their communities. Uh, again, it emphasizes the core institutional role, which is teaching and learning function, but also the research and knowledge product, product production function. And through this function, it can be able to position itself globally, but also using that global position to be able to relate to the local uh, context. But more linked to the local context is the economic engine role, where the university must consciously see itself as an employer, a purchaser of local goods and services, developing of local workforce, as well as attracting business and investors. And these four roles need to be seen as having a clear mission, vision through the institutional goal of the, of, of, of the university. And it goes down to be able to say, the adoption of an anchor strategy is, is, is a major shift in community engagement, lit, 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 literature in that it, 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 it moves on to providing measure, me, me, measurable indicators, as Nico was, was talking a while ago, as to how the university relates with this community. Of course, we know university contribute to development, but how can that contribution be, be, be quantified? How can it be actually measured? How can it be monitored and evaluated? And Kempton and colleagues argue that uh, serving an anchor role enables university and higher education institutions to, to generate interactions ref reflecting both the concept of proximity and community without, very importantly, the risk of becoming localistic. So it, it, it should continuously have the, the tension between the local and, and the global put in context as it relates with this, com with, uh, with this com community. Of course, this all, all this shows how the 
four, it's supposed to be four, the four kilos, which is the, 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 the core institutional role, the economic role, the social, social cultural role, as well as the, the knowledge innovation platform, which, which fits as well into the, the core institutional role. So this provides the key indicators as to how a university can measure itself, can position it, it, itself. And again, some universities who serve more an e economic role, while others will serve uh, a physical role, like the Soplaki University in Kimberley, which is now just, just being established. It has a significant role to play in the way it's real estate development, the building of residences, the building of offices. It fits into the city and serves this real estate de development role. And of course, it now begins to, to, to activate businesses into the region. And one of the questions we were asking, to, to what extent is the university in Kimberley consciously procuring, procuring from the local uh, businesses and not having to bring everything from Houteng or from Free State or, or Bloemfontein? When there is a conscious effort and a policy drive from the university to be able to fit, to, to, to play this role within the local context, then the university begins to see itself uh, as part of its community. Uh, so this speaks to its clear institutional anchor mission, how the university is leveraging institutional resources towards this mission, and how the university is ensuring that it benefits in its core, its core mission, while the community and the stakeholders also benefit within a win-win partnership. Of course, the next couple of slides will, will present a few evidence of how some South African universities are beginning to perceive themselves as anchor institutions and in the different ways in which they are doing that. Uh, but unfortunately, or, or just to kind of precede that, most South African universities have not in many ways adopted a place-based approach. And Nico and Leslie, they, they, they kind of captured that in their 2018 book. Uh, and, and the emphasis has been on the international and national competitiveness. And a very interesting case in point is the shift of naming of Nelson Mandela Metropolitan to Nelson Mandela University, and where the former vice chancellor was kind of making the case that the name Metropolitan limits the, the university's mandate. Uh, then one will argue that that means University of Pretoria or University of Cape Town will also have to change their names. But actually, it doesn't always have to be that the naming of that particular, that particular uh, naming of, of, the, of, of, of the institution will limit it to a very parochial or very local uh, focus. Uh, but as, 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 as argued elsewhere, serving an anchor role does not erode the knowledge creation function of the university, but, but it requires the university to link their research and real community problems that will just bring about better outputs. And so this tension has always been, even in the literature around uh, community engagement and how the university positions itself within a broader national or global context. The University of the Western Cape in its, in, has, has increasingly begun to put itself as an anchor university. Uh, the, the, the institutional planning director said uh, in one of the, the statements from the university that the university is committed to Bellevue and has significant, significant infrastructure uh, footprint in the area. In its institutional operation plan of 2016, 2020, the university has put itself in a clear statement as serving an anchor function within the Bellevue area. It states the university is an excellent university but increasingly perceived as an anchor institution. Of course, from my, my analysis, it has not moved significantly from this policy position to beginning to, to leverage its, its institutional resources and, uh, and, and its funding and a whole lot of, of other institutional dynamics you have to see to say the university is serving that anchor role. But there is a position that you can see the university is beginning to see itself beyond its campus, but within the city and the region. The University of Pretoria has made a couple of in initiatives and, and this project also is in partnership with the University of Pretoria, which is one of the 
first in, uh, university to put itself out there and, and using the concept of an anchor institution. And this has played out in a number of initiatives, uh, both in its main campus in Hartfield, as well as its Mam, its Mam, Mam, Mam Logic campus. Uh, a couple of initiatives have been identified, including the city improvement uh, project, uh, which was a partnership between the university and the Tuanim uh, uh, municipality, aimed at enhancing the locality within which the university is, is situated. I hope Professor Ogudo will be able to talk, talk a bit more to this during the discussions. Vit University has also taken initiatives to put itself out as an anchor institution. Uh, from, the, from, from its institutional positions, uh, the Global Change Institute perceives itself and, and the broader institution as an anchor institution. And the secondary, for, uh, the secondary focus of the university uh, or, or the, 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 the 21st century institute, which is a, 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 a collection of, 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 of institutions within the within Vitt University, sees itself to allow Vitt to pursue a strategic role as an anchor and boundary of, of organization producing research of scientific excellence required to contribute to the development of the, of the region. This has also been played out in a number of in, in, in initiatives, including the Simulongong Digital Innovation Precinct Initiative, which was coming a uh, coming together of the local of the city of the city of Johannesburg, business and industry towards revitalizing areas of Grand Fontaine. What university has not used explicitly used the word anchor institutions, but has be, begun to to develop programs and in, initiatives. This slide comes from the tra transformative summit that took place in, in 2017. And this was not an this is not an official position of the university in terms of the, the first three bullet points, but from the Grahamstown, the VC's 2021 plan to transform the local public school sector into a space where every child receives an education that equips him or her for life of, 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 of significance. And the issue of education fits into one of the key roles that our constituents are playing or are supposed to be playing. And so this points to a direction where the university is identifying itself within a particular context. Similar initiatives have been carried out uh, in a couple of universities. I, I can think also of the, the Talent Pipeline Project at Sorplaki University, where you can see particular initiatives of universities focusing on, on, on serving their communities. So what does this mean? Uh, in terms of for South African U universities. I, I, I think the main attributes of anchor institutions is that they need to be an intended intention, in, intended um, uh, mission and focus on the local as well as the, the national de development. There needs to be a clear policy towards the immediate region as well as the city development. This is beginning to emerge in some universities. They need to develop conscious links with local stakeholders within win-win partnerships in the nature of engagement. One of the critiques of the community engagement literature is that universities and academics always go to the community with a perception of having the, the knowledge. And this power dynamics has always been a critique of community engagement literature. The anchor institutional literature pushes for an engagement pattern where both the community stakeholders and the university perceive themselves in a win-win arrangement where the, 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 the city and the community actually benefit through the, 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 the numerous interventions as we have seen from Hatfield, from Vids, and from the other uh, in, in examples. And hence, there is long-term long planning as opposed to some of the community engagement initiatives. Some of them are long-term planning, but most often we realize it's a particular project that goes into the community for a couple of months or years and then moves out. But for a university to serve an anchor mission, there is more long-term planning between the university and its community stakeholders. But what implications, as I've already mentioned, there are missions that, are, that need to be put in place and uncommissioned and it's, it's beginning to, to emerge. 
uh, how this mission to get institutionalized will, will, will maybe become the next level of, of, of interest or of, of analysis. How are these statements being institutionalized within the institution? How is decision making taking place between the university and the local stakeholders? How are institutional resources being leveraged to be able to help the university serve the, its, its, its anchoring role while not compromising its drive for national and international relevance? In, in conclusion, I think university engagement remains an important pedagogical tool for universities through serving service learning, work integrated learning, and other in, in, in initiatives or interventions within which community engagement functions. Universities have social and economic responsibility to their com communities, nevertheless. And serving an anchor, as anchor institutions, I think, provide a stronger conceptual and practical framing for universities to respond to local community needs while being nas nationally, internationally com competitive. I think all universities serving an anchoring role are engaged, but we can have engaged universities who do not see themselves as anchors within their regions. However, each university will have to identify its anchor mission within its particular context, as we, as we have seen with a few examples. Uh, but for universities to start having this conversation as we are having now, uh, uh, as scholars becomes really important for how universities become anchors in their communities, in their cities, as well as in their regions. Thank you very much for listening. Nico? Yes. Very nice, Sam. Uh, I didn't expect anything less. Uh, the, but the, to me, the, the central point that you make is, is this moving away from this uh, community service and community engagement to uh, a different notion of collaboration with the, with the community. It's a, it's, it's a completely different notion than the sort of liberal helping the community notion that, 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 that we've had. I mean, one of the big successes of the Chinese system it, it, was just two things. The one was differentiation, identifying a number of top universities. And then the other universities had to be uh, regionally and locally engaged. They actually had to, that was their role. And they, and, but it's, a, a, it's not engagement role. They actually have to do business with the community. The, the, the community and the region must actually pay for services from the university. So that you actually have a, a kind of a development dynamic going. So, and instead of those universities also going to be globally competitive, they just don't have the, the resources for it. And, and I think that, uh, I think Ntini put on the chat a question as, as is how do you, the interesting question is how do you measure this? Uh, how do you measure the difference between engagement and uh, the collaboration. Uh, you made a statement about that there must be uh, mutual collaboration within the institution. So I think that uh, your point is very important about having a plan or having a, a, you know, to do it, but that's only one thing. The other thing is how can the community, how can the university actually measure that they do this? Because the universities who manage to do that, there's a, a great recently in the States, they use that in order to get more money and more support because they can actually, they actually demonstrating what, what they're doing. So, and, and I, I think we haven't quite got there in, in South Africa uh, uh, yet. And then just one thing from your paper about the land grant universities. It, it's a, that's another concept that, that is some, somewhat similar to Anchor. But the interesting thing to me about the land grant universities is uh, you talk a bit about in your paper uh, more as that they educated the farmers. But I've been reading that uh, what the land grant universities really did is they bought science for agriculture. Uh, they, they educated the farmers, but they, they bought the new 
innovation in farming uh, and spread it out over throughout America into one of the biggest sort of revolutions of agriculture ever. So, so that's again, I think it's this very interesting area to start looking at clarifying these concepts and so that we stop this mumble jumble where people just use different words uh, and with different ideas. But I'm sure uh, that uh, Leslie will clarify all these things for us. Hi, everyone. Hi, Nico. Hi, hi, hi. hi. <laughs> No, thank you, Sam. That was fantastic. And it's really nice to be, you know, we were back in 2017 trying to put together a, a collection around Anchored in Place, uh, which Nico was never as anchored in place in the debate as I was in, in, in trying to consider these issues. <clears throat> It is very interesting that even though maybe anchor institutions, um, you know, is a fading light to some extent, that kind of discourse to some extent, uh, um, you know, internationally, it seems to have gained momentum in South Africa <clears throat> in the last three or four years, although I haven't kept my eye that closely on, you know, as Sam has been doing on these uh, policy statements. Uh, it was interesting in that cartoon that you had up there from Kimberley, how it suggested that these great <clears throat> wealthy institutions like universities would save communities from poverty, violence, et cetera, in the, in the narrative underneath. <clears throat> and I, th I think that that might be, um, you know, one of the problems in a way, this notion that universities can be saviors for cities or that the kind of enlightened self-interest of the university can shine very brightly on the economic future of um, very different contexts, many of which are, are lagging and um, require a fundamental overhaul in urban policy in, in various ways. So, <clears throat> but that's not to say that anchoring is, is a bad idea and it doesn't have, um, you know, at an important role to play. I think the other thing to acknowledge is that the anchor discourse really comes out of the American or the Northern story of the urban crisis and um, in deindustrialization. And so anchoring is, is, is really um, originates in the kind of discussions around the hollowing out of inner cities as industries moved off to Asia and, and elsewhere or to cheaper labor kind of destinations. So it's about a recon, I mean, essentially the discourse is about urban reconstruction uh, and regeneration. And I think in, in Africa and in South Africa, I think a lot of our discourse around what universities uh, you know, what the image of university and the role they can potentially play uh, in many places around creating something new rather than restoring something, um, you know, restoring something. So there is a, a how well does this translate uh, from the north to the south? There are a lot of discussions about southern theory and how <clears throat> Our northern ideas are perhaps uh, inappropriate and tired, and but at the same time, the the, the discourse has uh, travelled well, actually, uh, globally. The other thing that I want to note is that um, you know if you see uh, where these kind of strategies are are generating results, it tends to be where where mayors are really very interactive with. Um, with vice chancellors or provosts or whatever. So I see much more of that happening in Latin America, um, actually, in a Latin American cities. Mayors seem to be able to have the capacity to challenge them in a way almost unsettle uh, national politicians. And I think there's something really dynamic about that. Um, and universities are partners in that kind of politics. Um, uh, uh, I don't see much of that in South Africa, the kind of uh, visionary uh, role of, <clears throat> of city level structures in, in really forming these alliances. I see the universities as first pushing outwards through community engagement, then establishing opportunistic 
and pretty much unregulated relationships with private sector enterprises, including, you know, if you housing, uh, especially actually uh, real estate capital. Um, and so areas like Rondebosch around UCT become very exclusionary. Rawson and other developers produce 2 million plus apartments for everyone. There's very little opportunity for social housing developments, et cetera. So I think that in a kind of unregulated space where there isn't national policy or there isn't even, re I mean, there isn't a regional policy and higher agent policy so concentrated at the national level, the capacity to form a kind of social contract at the level of the city, the neighborhood, the precinct that is beneficial, uh, 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 decolonizing in spirit uh, and so on, uh, and justice orientated is uh, often quite difficult. So the, the, the partnerships that exist tend to favor the powerful and in a way can often reproduce inequalities as, as uh, Richard uh, Florida, the famous creative class scholar uh, found out after declaring the creative class as the best thing to democratize cities and to create a new urban future, had to admit in 2017 that American cities had never been as unequal as they are now and that universities, the eds and meds and the knowledge sector and the technology had been the main culprits in creating that kind of inequality. So it is, uh, you know, uh, it, it is a, um, a strategy or an, a set of interventions into local level uh, city building that can have very detrimental impacts on things like inequality if it isn't, if it isn't uh, a public management uh, and a, a policy of proper engagement. Um, so I suppose, um, uh, the other thing that I think that one needs to be careful of is this kind of neutral and normative uh, narrative around the university. Uh, I wrote a book in uh, 2019, uh, City of Broken Dreams, which really looked at the imagination of the, the, role that, the role that the imagination of a university played in the development of a city. In this particular city, uh, the two players, main players were Rhodes University and fought here in the city of Buffalo City. And so it really explores how the one institution stood in a way for a, a progressive idea of liberalism and colonial and the agency of the, the settler community in partnership with others and the, you know, the fought here. So the, the image of the university was at play in the politics, the inequality and the history of of, of the city itself. And so there isn't this kind of neutral place from which one can say, well, the university is a really good thing. It, it's not implicated in any struggles uh, within the, the spatial environment. And um, so the whole question of, of you know, um, uh, anchor strategy, uh, just my final point is that, you know, the anchors that are being restored uh, often in these American cities and European cities are anchors that are very uh, familiar to the people that were once removed from those neighborhoods because they, um, but some of this heritage that is being, that, you know, these institutional libraries, uh, medical institutions, et cetera, kind of stand for uh, exclusion to some of the people they want to now include. So um, there's this, there's a politics around that that uh, needs to be recognized in relation to anchor institutions. But I think it's interesting. I, I mean, I welcome the debate and I think Sam's done an excellent job in around some of the broader issues and the specific institutional dynamics. One thing that I think would be very useful to do is to take stock of how uh, what different kinds of institutions have done on this place-based uh, integration agenda and, comp uh, you know, take an audit, really, of the, the situation. Stellenbosch has done a huge amount. Other institutions have done less. But uh, there are definitely learnings um, of various kinds that can be shared. Uh, and a kind of map could be drawn up of these are the things that actually have worked very well and to, to, to 
broad uh, benefit in South Africa. And these are the dimensions of these relationships that tend to be uh, lead to very adverse types of relationships within the places they are based. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. Okay. Oh, Nasima is saying you must uh, put on your camera, Leslie. And 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 uh, Leslie, I uh, yes, as usual, uh, both uh, dabble with the with the theoretical as well as the historical, and I must still get back to your book on uh, the one on Port Air and, and, and his London actually. I think that the uh, it's such a problematic thing. I mean, both both of you guys have now uh, have mentioned for the years ago. I was involved in a thing in for there where the agriculture department had set up a fantastic uh, dairy farm uh, with a few hundred cows. The local people were involved. The manager of the of the dairy farm was actually. Uh, a third year uh, agriculture woman student. And this thing was uh, going fantastically and people were talking about it uh, in different places. And the next moment it was cut down by uh, the, well, envy is always an explanation, but too easy an explanation. It, it was a thing that they were, they were a group of academics that didn't see this as the role of an academic institution. Uh, uh, so, I think there is, there is amongst our academics themselves still uh, a, a big problem about this. And then the pressure of publishing and of trying to be part of the global community, uh, uh, as if, as if the, and trying to disconnect themselves from, from where they actually are. And, and I think it's gonna be an interesting challenge for us to, to start talking a bit more and see if we can't get organizations like New South and them to start with more pressure on institutions and institutional leadership to explore this, both the local and the global uh, connectivity. Well, I saw in one of the chat comments about, uh, but, but how can a historically disadvantaged institution assist um, that's having its own financial problems? The, but, but the issue is again, is not assisting the, the, these uh, crumbling American cities were actually developed uh, between the community and, and the university. So the university, the university didn't have a lot of resources either, but the university did have more resources uh, and bought different things to it. I was just telling Nasima, I was reading the other day how people, this, this thing about the land grant universities and how they educated the farmers. But actually what the land grant university did is they bought science into agriculture. Uh, and so, so it was both an education task, but it was actually a, a, the science of crop growing and all these kinds of things. That, and that lifted up both the university as well as the community. So it's, I think we must get away from this thing that uh, universities in poorer areas can't do much for the community. Uh, can, can I add? Yeah. Um... I mean, the, the thing that struck me uh, about the anchor institutions and what, what's in your paper, Sam, is that it's a, an intentional strategy, that it's intentional on, on, on the part of the university. And to be intentional, it needs really the buy-in of management and council, because to be intentional, it requires structure, and structure requires resourcing. Um, and, and from what I've read about anchoring institutions, those elements are essential for the success of an anchor institution, because to start building those relationships outside of the university in an intentional way around your own strategy and the strategy of the city requires planning. And, and the thing that strikes me about this whole talk um, is that it also links to the work we've been doing on advancement um, at Inyatelo. And it's that in order to attract third stream income, you actually have to set up the advancement and development office. 
and invest in staff and invest in the data systems um, and invest in the training um, so as to reap the, the fruits of it. You also have to have leadership that's, that's, that's convinced and plays a role and a council that's convinced and plays a role. And all these new structures that have been developing post-democracy um, that weren't really part of university management structures before are finding, you know, trying to find the space um, that we're still grappling with. And so I'm just wondering about the intentionality and how one measures that. And, and Samuel, you know, it would be really interesting to know in terms of budgetary terms and, and management buying and staff buying, you know, how that is unfolded in the institutions you've been looking at. Samuel, is uh, Thanks, thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Nico, and uh, for the comments. Nazima, I think your point actually uh, speaks to the question in the chat from Ivan Govenda, uh, where he talks about all institutions are anchor institutions, all universities are anchor institutions, however, they operate in different contexts and institutional priorities. I think that's very true. And, and, and Nico supervised my master's uh, thesis many years ago. And one, one of the findings there was that the university was actually doing that, but they had no clue ab ab about what it was doing. Uh, mm -hmm. in the community. Uh, so it comes to the point of intentionality. Mm -hmm. Most universities are actually, by being there, they, they attract businesses, they enhance uh, real estate development and a whole lot of other things, but there is no policy, there is no intention, there is no relationship between the university and, and the community. So I, I do agree with, with Ivan, but I, but I think we, the universities needs to move, need to move to the next level of, of that. Uh, Nico, you were saying something? Oh, I, okay. Yeah, no, you go on, then I'll say something. Okay, no, no. then the other point I just wanted to respond to Leslie was the issue of the dynamic nature of the relationship between the, the, the city mayors and the vice chancellors. Mm -hmm. And that's actually very, very true. And that has also come up from our study in Kimberley, where the new vice chancellor, he went to, to grade one or grade two, with, 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 with some of the, the, the significant uh, people in Kimberley, the judges and uh, the political leaders. And so there is that relationship that it's supposed to, you imagine, you can either enhance that, that role of the university, or if they have different political ideologies, it might actually constrain the role of the university. But it becomes very important that that relationship between the vice chancellor and the political or social or economic leaders within the city is there. Uh, it speaks to social capital, it speaks to, to political capital, which sometimes the university needs to be able to play its role. Uh, I think I will get, uh, uh, really want also to open up that we open up to get some comments and, and, and questions from, from the participants. Jocelyn, can you help us with hands? If you see hands, um, please. Um. Well, can, can I make a, a final comment before yeah. while we wait waiting for, for hands? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, it does seem that, uh, you know, there are other metaphors that are um, perhaps more powerful than the anchor at the moment in the discourse, especially with, um, you know, online learning and the fact that place-based development has taken an ox since the pandemic. You know, the city center isn't what it used to be. It doesn't have that kind of gravity. People can work from anywhere. So the, there's much more of a kind of idea of a platform, knowledge platforms, rather than anchors. Mm -hmm. And there is this kind of notion that different kinds of knowledge come to one another. So there's a kind of lamination of, of opportunity. And this uh, takes the heavy centrist kind of notion of the university as anchor, leader, so, uh, et cetera, uh, sort of, it's a more you know, open discourse. But those, you know, you're getting that, that, that kind of language is coming from out of New York and, and cities that are well positioned to be horizontal, uh, you know, and, and to allow participation and inclusion. 
So that's just uh, is something that I picked up while I was trying to do some background reading was the extent to which new metaphors around layering of knowledge, uh, grafting um, and so on and so forth seem to, especially this idea of platforms, um, which yeah, is, is interesting, but not very developmental actually. It's an access driven term, but it's not actually very developmental. It doesn't really uh, point you in a particular direction. It doesn't give a mandate to go anywhere. So anyway, those are just uh, some extra comments I had. I want to make a comment on that, uh, uh, developing it a bit from the, the, the uh, I think one must also this distinction between being global uh, and, and being you know, trapped in the local and also the notion of of of, of the engagement the collaboration between the university and the community my wife is a hiv a tb specialist and the professor at uct in the public sector so she got like two thousand hiv patients he, he runs a, a, a meeting uh, every few months with these different practitioners uh, where they bring the, what do you call it? You know, these, uh, maybe these pictures that they take of the lungs and yeah, things, x-rays and things like that. They, they actually bring it to the meeting and show it and then they discuss it and he comments as the big expert, etc. I asked him one day about it, he said, look, I've got so much research money that I don't know what to do with it. But every research problem that I investigate, I pick up in these forums mm -hmm. because I'm not in a community. I don't know what the problem that they're coming in with it. But at the same time, it's a huge uh, help for the doctors who's in the public community to be advised by, now he's now internationally known as one of the leading people in this field. So, so there's not, no actually money involved but it's an enormous uh, exchange of knowledge that actually helps the local community, but actually also informs the, the global community. So I think we, but then my friend Peter Maasen and I, I helped him a bit, did a study for the German vectors on this issue of the engagement between the university and, and the community. And they were just two simple findings. The one was, that the universities have got no structure to structure these things. Mm -hmm. There isn't a dean of uh, yes, development yes. or a dean of, of this, but, but on top of that, they've got no way of, of, of popularizing this. They, they don't have a, a dedicated science communication uh, uh, sector that can actually tell the community. So, I mean, so nobody in Cape Town knows that this world expert sits there at, 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 at UCT and he uh, uh, sort of helps the local community. But, and then if you read the UCT uh, pamphlets, etc., it's about a, a few more transform, transformative appointments or something. So, uh, the, so the, the issue of structuring it and then the issue of communicating it, both to the community in which they are, but also to the global community, I think is a because it's not a structure in the institution and there isn't particular money for it. But I think we must really push this for universities. Each one should have some kind of a unit that deals with us. Techno and Timmy. And Timmy? And then Simon. She, she has to say. Hi, Nico. Hi, Dan Timmy. Nice to hear you. Can I see you? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting have old. Have you aged since you were in the class? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's good to, good to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much, Sam, and um, those who uh, prepared this, I enjoyed. Um, however, for someone who has been writing about community engagement for a while now, and thank you, Nico, that you used to be very, uh, one of the critique of what is this community engagement talking about? <laughs> so uh, I've been asking myself, I think when Sam was talking, even um, Leslie, I was asking myself, what's the difference? I, I don't see much you know, difference between this concept. Perhaps we need to unpack them again. Um, what is this anchor institution? You, you, UWC calls themselves as engaged university. What does it mean? And I think it's important we unpack this concept and what, what, what are the key features and what are the implications to institutions, structures and leadership and you know, um, direction? 
I think for me, that would be one way of moving forward in terms of, you know, um, really being clear about are we really moving away from this language that we've been using for a while? Um, or we just stuck with this big concept without him moving forward. So I think some some we should do some work on that. That was a, just a comment. Thank you, Celine. Thank you, Celine. Should we also take you off from Tino? Hi. No, I have a comment. Hey, Celine. Will you also switch on your camera? Celine. Uh, now, now, I, I just have to tell the audience that this man was talking in Cape Town this morning uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, uh, at, at the workshop on postdocs, and I hear now, and now he's back in Durban. Uh, <laughs> but apparently, he never really left Durban. That's <laughs> right. Nice to see you. <laughs> so, so you put your finger on it now, uh, Nico, because the obvious question is, and you've put it very sharply. And what it suggests then is that a new measure of the extent to which a university is transformed or not is whether now you're an anchor institution, mm -hmm. right? So here we're moving from the analytical immediately into the normative, mm -hmm. right? And that's the danger. Yeah. And it's exactly what Leslie, I think, in part is warning about these concepts that come from somewhere, and now we want to implement them. Okay, we'll indigenize them. We'll uh, we'll theorize a bit more about them and so on. So let me let me approach this through the prism of a Rhodes University that I know best. I don't know other institutions, right? So Sam is right in a sense. You're an anchor institution, whether you want to be or not. If you Rhodes, mm -hmm. because without Rhodes, and the sixty-five percent <laughs> of the contribution to the GDP of the town, and the single largest employer, there is no Makanda. Yeah. I was there last week for two days. You must look at the state of the place, right? The greatest threat to Rhodes University the is Makanda municipality, yeah. right? So I think what I'm getting from Sam is the idea of intentionality. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, and I'm quite clear, this is not community engagement. Yeah. Whatever the virtues of community engagement, it's something far wider, deeper, more extensive, and so on. So, so what is this uh, involving an institution like Rhodes to be an anchor institution? It can't just be place as a throwaway because place can be national, place can be continental. Community engagement is not only about local communities. The communities of Rhodes are in Malawi, in Angola, when it comes to questions of insects and fisheries and so on, right? So it seems to me that if we want to become normative about this, and that one of the measures that we want to apply in terms of how transform is our institution and anchor institution is the way to go, then I think we need to do a whole lot of analytical work and theorize this much more clearly before we spring this as a new thing about you not transform unless you're an anchor institution, <laughs> right? And let me just remind ourselves because I think this is the, uh, the, the worry for me, Nico. Eight months ago, we were told we must become the engaged university in a massive jamboree that you have organized, right? And I asked myself, so what is the engaged university now? And so are we gonna have these layers of anchor university, engaged university, research university, all congealing in certain ways and all leading in the same direction or in different directions, right? Must every university be an anchor university? Must it have it as part of its mission? And I think we must be, uh, we must be honest about this. What is the ability, the capacity, the capability of some of our universities to be anchor universities? When, they, when they're struggling, honestly, to just be universities. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's not a financial issue. That's yeah. not the issue here. It's a question of purposes. What are the purposes of a university? And what is it that they can meaningfully take on in a place like Makanda or in a place like, uh, you know, Kimberley or wherever for that matter, right? So I think it's an attractive concept in terms of what it tries to do in terms of the kind of engagement, right? But is the engagement entirely to be an anchor university of the local 
or is it also the provincial? Is it also the national and so on? What does anchor mean in terms of place and space and those kinds of things, right? But certainly a very interesting concept that I think we should be thinking about more and be doing more work around, if you like, to see to what extent our universities, you know, and I'm not sure you can impose a definition and then go and look to what extent our universities are doing that. Why don't we see what our universities are actually doing and to what extent that can be built on and taken forward and maybe some of them would want to become anchor universities. So for me, if I was still at Rhodes, this would be a very interesting idea, but I would want to think very hard about Rhodes' ability, even Rhodes' ability, in the light of my experience of eight years there to be an anchor university in a town that is utterly dysfunctional. Where does the university start and end? And where does the local state start and end? So those are the thoughts coming to my mind, but very similar uh, presentation. Can I can I respond in a, uh, to that to Salim uh, on that? I mean, I think if uh, let's uh, Salim, if Rhodes was institutionally recognised as an anchor institution, whatever that might mean. In other words, that there the the national government the national and the regional level uh, were, were obliged to support or, uh, you know, involved in an integrated uh, geographically scaled relationship with the city, perhaps its challenges would, it could find support from other levels of dedicated support from other, other levels of government if there was some recognition of its plight in that thing. So, Yes, it cannot do what you're suggesting. You know, it's carrying a load that is un it can't carry and it's going to crumble. You know, it's a crumbling space. But, uh, and I think, you know, I did, um, I did some stuff on smart cities recently and I was really quite impressed by the India, pro, uh, you know, words. at one level, very flashy, uh, smart city, 100 smart city program. But the most interesting thing for me was the imperative to integrate smart development in existing neighborhoods rather than to have new smart cities out there in the felt. Um, and secondly, once, once that decision had been made, there was a national grant, the, re, the state level uh, uh, government was responsible for providing the startup infrastructure that was needed for that. The city level government was to provide the land and make sure the roads were working and the cables were there. And so all of a sudden, this uh, recognition of, uh, you know, uh, of a precinct or an anchor space where universities play, uh, it, it ensured that it just couldn't go to, to pot, which is, uh, you know, the danger of a uh, um, and it's it's precisely for these reasons that, for instance, at Forte, they build another uh, however many million rands worth of houses behind the university gate rather than in the town of Alice, because the risk in the town would be so great, uh, given the absence of infrastructure and support that exists there. And then, you know, inversely, you get, get uh, the Witz uh, and the Bromfontein scenario, which is a very much up and coming dynamic. A lot of techies want to be in there. And that also needs to be uh, something that needs to ensure that too much money, too much inequality doesn't flow into that environment and that it's kind of regulated that poorer students can still get places to stay, that there are opportunities. So I'm kind of in favor for of a system, whether you call it an anchor institution or use another kind of language. I mean, there's other ideas, innovation districts, I'm, that's too neoliberal and so on, but an engaged precinct that spatially uh, the agency of universities and their capacity and their responsibilities are kind of integrated into the system that the stakeholders don't say, oh, that's something for the, that's Blade's department. Don't bother us with that here. He must sort that nonsense out. And I think, yeah, that would be my point. I think I've made it. So Leslie, my response would be that if I was still at uh, Rhodes at this point in time or earlier, I would certainly want to engage around this much more. And in ways that indigenize these ideas, maybe even not use this term anchor, right? 
but certainly what the, I, the core ideas behind it. And then of course, I would want to put a, a coalition together that is not just about money, it's about, you know, about pushing the ideas, the support, creating the networks and the coalitions locally, nationally, and so on. And so if we could have something like that, and if it can become part of your funding, right, for pursuing this idea, because some good things could come out of it. One of those things could be the survival of Makanda itself, right, or the survival of some other small towns. So I think it's worth exploring really in a very kind of uh, ambitious way even, you know, because I think the, the winning could be great here, right? The losses, uh, you know, may not be that great. You know, we, we tried, we failed. But if you can get this right for a place like Makanda, I mean, it will be brilliant. Uh, but what you guys are talking about in our 2012 book, we looked at the, we did a study on, on three successful systems in the world that where the university and development has become linked. And it was South Korea, Finland, and an American state. I can't quite remember the name now. But one of the, one of the central Pandipala did this study for us that came out of it was what he called a, a pact. And a pact is that there is an agreement. This thing if the university now wants to get involved in the city, uh, how do they do it? But it's not just the, the, the university in the city. They actually also need to be national policy support for this kind of thing. So you can't, it can't just, uh, at the moment, it entirely depends on individual institutions and some cities and some universities who, who want to get into this. There's no, there's no national fund to encourage this kind of thing. It's not part of national policy. Uh, there, uh, Blade is busy with other things. So I think uh, a very important part of this discussion of the importance of, of the of the, you know, whatever we call it, the anchor university, the development university or whatever, it has to become part of also a, na a national discussion. Tabisi. Ah, there isn't Tabisi. You can ask. Trap, will you, will you switch on your camera? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will do so. I'm getting old, Nico, as some good you are I'm <laughs> holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to shock Nico. <laughs> okay, let's see where it's coming on. Yes, you were almost in the little bit. Uh, it comes on, but I think my face scares it a bit. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, it's nice to see you, Nico, and, and thank you very much to Sam. And also, I've been listening quite attentively to Leslie and also to Salim. And what I wanted to contribute is um, just to give you a sense or, on how this debate of, of anchor institutions, you know, um, what, you know, uh, you know, took root in, in you know, how, how it panned out, uh, you know, at the University of Pretoria. Ah, yes. And I think University of Pretoria is probably a classic example of how, you know, many people found this concept problematic. It, on the one hand, uh, most of the academic staff were saying, you know, we have a very advanced community engagement policy, which is recognized by, um, you know, uh, which, 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 you know, which uh, management supports and also uh, uh, the, the council. So we've been doing community engagement all along. So what is this ENCA institution, you know, um, how, how does this ENCA institution debate now add to, you know, value to what we're already doing? Now, the main question there was then, well, were you actually engaged with the community? You were doing work within the community which was not necessarily engaged with you. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't a mutually beneficial kind of engagement. So that's when it clicked to everybody that 
anchor institutions are not about um, you know, um, fulfilling the professional requirements of undergraduate students. You know, in you know, in having a community engagement, or or even um, you know, making your undergraduate students in any discipline socially aware or, or or something like that. So that is a major difference between anchor institutions and you know, and you know, anchoring and 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 community engagement, and the you know, the local global engagement, you know, um, the question was, we, UP services, you know, uh, so many communities. I think it's Salim who mentioned that, you know, Rhodes has many communities. UP has communities all over South Africa, uh, or, you know, nationally and, and, and internationally. Um, but there were two communities which were of immediate, concern to UP. And that's where the anchor institution notion made sense. And that was the Miami Lodi campus and oh, yeah. the Hartfield <laughs> campus. And very interestingly, for very different reasons. For the Hartfield campus, the university was threatened by urban decay. And it just had to, initially people did understand what community engagement can happen within Hatfield. But with urban decay, it became very clear that there has to be something done. And the, the idea of an anchor institution now made sense. In Miami, it was a totally different scenario. There was no urban decay. The urban decay has always been there. <laughs> and to uplift this community. So you had, you know, you had this spectrum. You have this one university which is itself says local national, global, and on the other hand, it has Mamilodi on this side, Hatfield on this side, and many other international communities. So it kind of embodied the contradictions inherent in, in, or, you know, in, in anchor institutions and community engagement. Now, all in all, this institutional dynamics, what, what it actually boiled down to was, should we rather, Stay, the social, the you know, anchor institutions can never um, represent the totality of the social responsiveness mandate of the university. You, you know, it's you you can't say it's an anchor institution. You can talk of the Mamelodi campus as an anchor campus. That's what many people then preferred. That you have an anchor campus which is Hatfield, an anchor campus which is Mamelodi. And that way we could move ahead with a level of comfort, but I can, you know, safely say that the, you know, you know, the, 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 there's still, there's still, a, a, you know, there's no unified understanding of uh, what an anchor, you know, what, what, you know, what policy the university should, um, should adopt. And just to make one last example, our faculty of veterinary science, for example, have an animal clinic in Mamilodi, and they've always done work in Mamilodi. But because you know, we are the only faculty with, the vet, you know, with veterinary sciences, they saw themselves, you know, the, the anchor institution concept doesn't work for them. They, they are in communities in Limpopo, in the Eastern Cape, all over the place. So um, I just wanted to give you that perspective and you know, how this, uh, this debate actually um, panned out in, in UP. It's very complicated. I'm not answering many of the questions, but it's very complicated. So each is, I think in the same way that um, Rose might, might actually, uh, as Salim said, might actually, or even Forte lend itself to being an anchor institution but other institutions will multi campuses, different communities, it serves local and international. It becomes very difficult. You have to have a very nuanced policy to, you know, to, you know, to accommodate this. Thank you very much. And Dabi Singh, uh, give us now a totally objective, unbiased opinion of where <laughs> was Victoria the most successful, in Matfield or in Mamalodi? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, it's, it's, it's very difficult, Nuko, to, to say we've been successful um, because, I mean, this is a huge project. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a lifetime thing. Once you say you're an Yanka institution, it's not something you're going to, you know, reap benefits immediately. It's, it's you know, we're looking, you know, we, we had indicators in Mamelodi because we focused on the educational ecosystem. Okay. And we, we looked at statistics, like how many of the residents, you know, are employed, how many are unemployed, how many have a matric, how many have degrees and so on. So we depended on Stats SA for that. Um, and the idea was, if you were focusing on grade 12, you know, the, the academic enrichment, after five to 10 years, you know, what is your target? Would you have had say 5% of the matriculants? Now they are 25%, but these are fluid communities. Yes. <laughs> very fluid communities. So, you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So. I think both uh, the politically correct answer is both were successfully. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because there's lots of observable changes in that field. I mean, you can see there's some things going on. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, while you're looking there, I saw Diane had, had put a, a, a note or a comment in. Can we call Diane? Can, can I say something very quickly here? I think the, uh, the, 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 that's a key thing. It's a place-based intervention. That's exactly, you've, the university has many communities. They spread far and wide. But this thing about an anchor role is, a, is actually you can't decouple it from place-based uh, uh, agendas. And I think that's, that's really important. And when you talk about that obviously the culture of those places yeah. and what they represent and their kind of charisma within the the ecology of universities and places in the nation really very important they must be different they must be indigenous and so in fact you know that's really the essence of what uh, I have tried to say is that these places have enormous capacity for newness, transformativeness in our society. And that's, I mean, I've kind of been, a, I'm an anthropologist by training and, you know, culture is kind of the main thing, but that's. Diane, how do we Diane? Do no, Diane will just speak. Um, Diane, will you switch on your camera? There ah, we go, yeah. thank you. Let's switch it. I, I saw you made a comment here, it's a bit a bit back perhaps, but uh, interesting for me, it was interesting that there's a difference be between uh, that community engage, that engagement in, in particularly in South Africa that seems to have been seen very much as a form of redress rather than actually uh, a partnership in development. So I think uh, in the South African context, etc., we we have to we have to stop looking at that you that the university must just pull up or we just help this community or like in Mamalodi, but it's actually it's actually something that's going to benefit. Uh, it must have a development project for both. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, the, the thank you, um, Nico. The point I was uh, making was that um, the mandate of community engagement when it was introduced to, was to make universities more transformative and developmental by nature. So I don't think we should pitch these two concepts against each other. Okay. I rather see that community engagement might be the vehicle to help us to, to you know, anchor in our local communities. But something that hasn't really been mentioned today, which I think is key to all of this, is relationships. Because without meaningful relationships, you can't set up useful partnerships that will have social um, impact um, at the end. You know, ultimately, we don't do community engagement as an end in itself. We do it for community um, development and for social change. So, you know, key to that is the relationship that is both the community in that community university partnership 
So yeah, not, just not to pitch it one against the other, but rather to see community engagement uh, as a vehicle to, to, for universities to become more developmental and to build the, those partnerships that need to, to be built. Okay, thanks. Salim, you had to end up. Yeah, so, so I would just contribute to that to say, look, there are different kinds of community engagement too. You know, yeah. we're in generation four community engagement. Old style community engagement, I don't think lends itself to the anchor con institution no. concept. Service learning, however, mm. potentially is a seamless entry into becoming an anchor institution, right? Because so the question really becomes, you know, if we are not just going to be developmental, right, in the Makanda context, what does it mean to proclaim yourself an anchor university in terms of teaching and learning, in terms of research, mm -hmm. and all those core purposes of a university, right? That's what would excite me. And how would you bridge in the context of a Rhodes, which is not just a local institution, it's a national institution. It plays in the global field also. Now, there will be paradoxes. There might even be contradictions. I don't think they are impossible to manage, right? And you have to prioritize how important is it to be an anchor university. And I, I agree with Leslie. I think is, it is place-based. It is not about being an anchor university for some communities in Angola. It is about Makanda. Mm -hmm. In the same way that I understand WITS to be about Bramfontein, right? Mm -hmm. But the moment you start playing that role in Makanda and to the extent that you are successful, Nico, it also creates new uh, pressures. Yes. Because the people in Alicedale are gonna say, why are you yeah, leaving us out? Us. <laughs> the people there are gonna say, why are you leaving us out? And so on, right? So success itself could br bring some incredible new challenges, it seems to me, right? And, and I think, yes, it is gonna be about coalition packs and so on. My last point is this. I suspect if Sam reads my inaugural uh, uh, speech of September 2006, he will conclude uh, this vice chancellor wanted to make Rhodes an anchor university, yes. right? Yes. And he may, not be in part, he may not be in part wrong, right? But let me just say it uh, honestly, it was a singular failure. <laughs> what we try to do, this big long-term partnership with Wakanda municipality, the partnership with the schools, unless some things have changed since I left, let me be honest about that. Mm -hmm. It was not a money issue. We failed because of the psychology of that town of Makanda. It's being screwed over too long by colonialism and apartheid and so on. So to really build something there as a university in partnership without being seen literally as this knight in white shining armor coming to develop the city or the town becomes a big challenge in a place like Makanda, and I suspect in other towns also. Uh, uh, Nico, I think the point that- May that I comment is... before? Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. I want to comment. <laughs> Can I comment, yes, make yes, a yes. comment on um, Salim? I think he's being incredibly hard on himself because he's still like most development uh, processes when you initiate them the complexity of them there's always a kickback but the very education program that he started when he was here has gone on to turn public education around in the city uh, we've gone in 2015 from being the one of four worst performing districts in the country to the best performing city in the province for the last three years and that initiative was started by him, so he shouldn't be so hard on himself. Okay, the, my comment would be, like, what that me. says, it takes time. Oh, I didn't see the fruits of that myself. Maybe it came a decade later, so I'm very excited. But clearly, it's going to take time if you want to do this seriously. I just wanted to say it's a, it's a very rare occasion that the ex-Vice Chancellor uh, declares failure <laughs> uh, because usually they declare uh, victories for things that they didn't achieve. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thanks, Nico, and thanks to, to Dana. I think I, I made mention of to that uh, that that program at the uh, Rhodes and and, and success. But I think the point that I wanted to make uh, from Salim 
or the point I take home, which I made mention to briefly, is the issue of the fact that we need more empirical work to be able to say anything de definitive on unconstitutions within the South African context. Uh, we need to have a really deep level of, of consistent studies across a number of institutions. As he is saying, for one to be able to say, this is the nature of the relationship between the community and the university, this is the na nature of the relationship between business and, 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 and government, for there to be any kind of an anchor or whatever terminology we decide to use. And that is a point that I think uh, Nazima was, was talking about when we started this project as to how do we move from this concept paper uh, to the empirical. And of course, it always comes down to money, but, but, but that's a very key point that, that, that has been made. Uh, I think for me, that's really the, the, the point that, that Salim had also made earlier on moving from the normative to the an, an analytical and moving from the analytical to the, the normative. That, is, that will be informed by empirical evidence. And Leslie made the point about taking stock of the place-based agenda of, of successes. But I think we also need to take stock of the failures to be able to say, why has not worked as much as Salim Hula wanted it to work in Makanda? What has happened in Fort Hare? What are the challenges in Alice? Uh, and how can Saul Plucky, for example, learn for that going forward, being, be, being a new university in Kimberley, how can they learn from that uh, in terms of becoming what they, they aspire to become in, the, in this, the, the, the strategic plan? So thanks for very much for the comments, Salim. And also to, to Diana, I used some of the literature she shared with me from Rhodes University in the initial concept paper. Oh, Nashima? Yes, I, I wanted to add to this conversation um, and pick up on Leslie's point um, about universities not being neutral. And I think that's such an important mm -hmm. point to make um, because it's not only even universities not being neutral, but the, 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 the neutrality of local government and regional government and national government in engagement with the university. Um, and, and that tension that emerges in terms of the interaction, interaction and engagement. And um, I think this is an important point for anchoring, um, particularly when it comes to academic freedom and institutional autonomy, how politics plays itself within the academic, plays itself out in the academic mm -hmm. environment. And we've seen how that is happening in many of our institutions. And so I would really want to thank you for that point, Leslie. Um, to, you know that that neutrality is not what we're about, but really, you know, engaging with that the, the concept of of the neutrality. So I'm going to hand over back to Nico. No. <laughs> Here we go. What? No. Anybody else who wants to? I see a lot of women's names on the screen here, but not a lot of them have said anything. It's been an engaging conversation though, really. Yes, 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 but there's um, some other people who want to make a comment. Are we missing hands? Um, Jocelyn, have you seen anything in the chat that we've missed? Yes, um, you may see my name there for a comment in the chat, but it's actually from Nerissa, and I think she's left the, um, the meeting already. But I think okay. maybe you do want to still comment on what she said there. She says, given the economic crisis facing many of our universities, it would appear that developing a pathway to anchoring a, new, a university may seem less attractive. How does one balance the financial dilemmas facing especially our historically black universities with the, the strategic role or vision as an anchor? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the only comment that we haven't actually um, taken further. Anyone want to take it? But I think the, 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 I've got a bit of a problem with it because it, the, the, assum the, the assumption seems to be that the university is more wealthy and therefore university can form a partnership and then there will be development. Mm -hmm. But actually, many of these uh, American universities have, uh, uh, benefited hugely from their community uh, anchoring and, and engagement. So there's, there's resources uh, uh, in a feedback loop, they, we, we, it's, it's not a one way thing. So actually, this is a way that universities themselves can grow. And some of them had some of those big 
land grant universe, small land grant universities became huge universities. So uh, I think it's, yeah, it's not a, a one way thing. Show for closing remarks. Yeah. Well, there's Leslie, you can start. Leslie, you can start yeah, the yeah, I think the, the, the key thing is, um, I mean, situ the situations are very different. Uh, and the whatever instruments, uh, let's say, were introduced should recognize that. But it would be, uh, um, it would be very important to, yeah, just to reiterate the point that there needs to be capacities uh, for local level the regional level and the national level transformative uh, situation mired by you know mired by place rather than enable in that sense that certain places are just mired in place and yeah. the second point i want to make and i must Leslie, we're losing you. Or is it? Yeah. Oh. Let me just check the band. When I worked at Fort Hare for a decade uh, as a area, um, yeah, that brought into question all in these processes of transformation, uh, or you know, and place-based. They are place-based um, uh, citizens, members of those communities for the times that they are there. Yeah, and student organizations uh, can mobilize around this agenda, I think, in, in really important ways, and it can be really enriching. Mm. For the students, too. For young, young people to be involved in that. Probably, uh, that's, re that's really all I had to uh, say, except that I agree with Sam. We, we really need to document this, um, this setup and share learnings. I mean, you know, where where institutions have made uh, significant uh, developments in this area, they should be able to share those so that others can know what, you know, uh, what what has happened, what has transpired, as well as independent investigation of, you know, uh, what, uh, yeah, what's yeah. Good. Diana. Thanks. I, I didn't get everything Leslie said, but I got enough of it to get the gist of him speaking to citizenship, etc. So one of the forms of community engagement, which uh, I think are probably um, not used as much in this country as in others, is volunteerism and you know forms of citizenry. And I think there's huge potential through anchor institutions to create spaces where we can use the social capital of students. And in doing that, you know, one of the purposes of higher education is to grow knowledgeable, critical thinkers that have a heightened sense of social responsibility. And through those kind of volunteer programs, uh, but really orga uh, highly organized, targeted programs you can get real mutual benefit coming out of that. The opportunities for the students to grow the self-development, but also the, um, the opportunities for that, that social capital and the extra hands in Vice Chancellor's um, education initiative. We have 500 students that work weekly as volunteers in the, the various schools that have been quite central to the change I was speaking to earlier. So really just affirming what Leslie was saying that it presents amazing opportunities for um, students. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Sam? Yes, I think uh, the one thing I, I just wanted to, to say in closing is what Diana has just mentioned. We, are, we, can, we have kind of spoken a lot on the three the three roles of ANCOS, which is the core the teaching and research function, the economic function, and real estate or urban development, and not very much on the cultural or human or public good function of the university, which Diana was just uh, uh, referring to. And I think that even universities in historically poor 
uh, disadvantaged communities can actually play that role in terms of, 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 of citizenship development, of public good, the, the public good fun, uh, function. So that goes, goes back to, to the point that Justin was putting up. Being rich or not, being financially viable or not, communities can actually engage with university through a range of, of means. And that's just one uh, which I wanted to the public good function of, 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 of the anchor of, of the university as an anchor. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Nico, thank you for the comments. Yeah, Leslie, thank you very much. And I look forward to further engagements. Wonderful. Thank you, Nasima. I can just say we uh, in this week uh, got a grant from uh, Oppenheimer. I said I'll never take money from the Oppenheimers, but now that has also changed. Uh, never say never. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to have a, a set of uh, policy dialogues uh, uh, in a few selected areas, and we must still determine which areas. Uh, but this one that we discussed today is clearly a possibility. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I would like to, when we get going, we only got the papers today, uh, then I would like to invite some of you to participate in the debate, in the dialogues and collaborate with Nassim Army. That would be wonderful, Nico. Um, and I, you know, on behalf of Inatello and the US South African Higher Education Network, would really like to thank everyone who's participated in the conversation. It's been such a wonderful conversation. Um, and I think the, the chemistry among the speakers was yeah. very special. So and um, thank you, Samuel. Your work has really started this for us. And to Leslie for being a respondent and, and taking time to be with us. Um, Salim, you really supply, surprised me when you appeared. I know how busy you are. So a huge thank you to you and Professor Ugude and to Diana and to all of you who have been part of this conversation. Big thank you to Nico. Oh, well, As I said, you're, uh, a, you're a, a very privileged, <laughs> privileged to have you with us. Um, it's been a long time and um, you've played such an important role in the university, in the higher education sector, in terms of the, the policy development process. So really, really grateful to have all of you on board. We are going to have other webinars around anchoring. We will send out notification. It would be great to, to collaborate yes. Nico, into the future. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks, Jocelyn, for all the hard work and the Inatello team, Jacques, Bayanda, Firio, all of you for just being present um, and continuously supporting the process. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you. Thanks very much, Nasima.